Good morning. Um, all right, so um, most of you or all of you were at my last lecture where I covered a million topics really fast. So now I'm going to cover a smaller number of topics, but probably, um, hopefully you've seen some of these concepts before, but I'm going to go into them in, in different ways maybe that you haven't seen before. So bioinformatics databases and web servers. And in my work at Berkeley, I created bioinformatics databases and web servers. There's a lot to, um, to love about them. And sometimes they're a little frustrating. But generally, as a bioinformatics scientist, you're going to use them a lot. So the differences between databases and web servers, databases are usually about database queries. People generate data, or they're bringing together data of different types and they make it accessible through a database, and there may be a web input where you can pick what you want to find, and it'll display that. And behind the scenes, what's going on is, it's a database query against a database schema. And there's different types of data. Most of the biological data of interest, as I was saying last time, are graphical. But most of the databases that you'll be working with are relational databases. So they're designed for tabular data, not for graphical data. Web servers are designed to provide compute resources. So for instance, if you use PFAM, that's scoring an input sequence against a database of hidden Markov models. So it's both a database that you can download hidden Markov models and multiple sequence alignments and data from, but it's also a web, a web server that provides the ability to do something with something you provide. It crunches it in a certain way. In this case, it's going to score it against thousands of hidden Markov models. And most of these resources provide a little bit of web server and database technology. Um, if you haven't seen the nucleic acids research annual issues of web servers and databases, that's the place to go because they will show you the top databases for that year. Uh, it's a very competitive journal and any web server or database that is acceptable for publication has to have a really good user interface with a tutorial. <laughs> So if you see something in one of those issues, you know that it will be relatively easy to use. So some of the major resources, Uniprot. How many people here have used Uniprot? That's wonderful. It's one of my favorite resources. How about the NCBI? All right, good. So you'll see that there's actually a lot of data that they hold in common, but they only hold protein sequences. For instance, we'll have different accessions different identifiers in the two databases, and you can find the cross-references. Um, PDB, the protein data bank, there are different mirror servers for PDB. The one that I use is the RCSV. SCOP also has different servers, one at Berkeley, one in the UK. Uh, PFAM is, in fact, all over the place. The gene ontology, now, I don't know if you've heard of TMHMM, which is a transmembrane helix prediction server. It's uh, in Denmark. Uh, it's one of the best, and I will show you how to use it. And string. How many people here have used string? A few of you. All right. I bet that a lot of you are going to use it before the end of the semester. It's one of the coolest tools. It has a really nice user interface. It makes predictions of protein-protein interaction. It'll give you data. It'll show you what's the support for predicted interaction. Is it experimental? Is it bioorthology? Is there some text mining of an abstract in a journal? There's all sorts of things that it does, and they're all very <coughs> useful. I'm going to illustrate these resources using two different proteins. One is drosomyosin from Drosophila, and I showed you that last time. Uh, it's part of the uh, innate immune arsenal of the Drosophila species, and a potassium channel from humans. So let's get going. So here's Uniprot. There's NCBI. There's the protein data bank at the RCSV. Here's a SCOP. In fact, there's two different SCOPs I'm showing you. Uh, there's PFAM. And now I'm going to show you a PFAM analysis. How many of you have used PFAM? <coughs> Only one, two, maybe two and a half people. <laughs> All right. PFAM is one of the most important tools to use. And um, it's really easy to use. So whatever you do in this class, you want to use PFAM. So you take PFAM, you go to uh, the main page. I think this is a different, this is different than what I used last time. Yeah, this one's yeah. fewer buttons. Um, and there's a, I hope I don't screw this up. The red button is the, Yeah. that's the pointer. Yeah. 
Hi. So you have an input box. You're going to input a sequence in FASTA format. Have you heard about FASTA format? You all know about FASTA format. It's a particular format, and you're going to use it as an input form for virtually every uh, database or web server that you use. And what happens is you get a result that looks like this. So this is all clickable. You can click on this. You can click on this. This shows you that your protein has two domains that it has found. You need to know how PFAM works. It's probably the most restrictive set of positions in a domain. The domains are defined using evolutionary ideas, not structure per se. Um, so in fact, the structural domain may start earlier and end later, but the region that P uh, PFAM is recognizing is a subset of the positions. And if you go here, you can click on this and you can get to information about that particular domain. PFAM organizes domains into clans. This is analogous to the SCOP superfamily uh, concept, where proteins that are related or structures that are related by evolution according to SCOP are put into superfamilies. PFAM uses this uh, word clan. So if you click on here, you'll get to all the PFAM domains that belong to that. Here you'll see that it's from position 39 to 130 that are identified in your sequences uh, corresponding to that domain. In the HMM, it's matching from position 1 to 94. The second domain, the ion trans domain, is starting at HMM position 2, which means it's missing the first position. That's not a big deal. But if we're missing much more, you might see a jagged edge on the domain uh, diagram here. Um, and then you have the E value. E values, remember, that is the number of hits you'd expect by chance alone in a database of that size. It's not the same thing as a probability. So you want E values that are small, typically less than 0 0.001. Some resources will use 0 0.005 as a cutoff. You can look at the alignment by clicking here, and then you can examine the alignment between your query sequence and the HMM consensus sequence. <laughs> have you all heard the term <coughs> consensus sequence? I don't see any chalk. <coughs> consensus sequence? Consensus sequence is um, a string of characters oh, that, oh well, you'll just have to imagine it. Um, means that the most frequent character um, is found below that threshold. So here we have three choices. They all have equal probability. So there'll be something in the background that probably says which of these three characters is most common, and then use that one. That might be a lowercase i, and then there'll be a lowercase s. So that's what your consensus sequence would look like. But in the HMM, there are probabilities over all the amino acids. <coughs> Later on, we'll see possums, <coughs> which is a position specific scoring matrix. <coughs> Who knows what resource uses possums? Yeah. Cyblast, exactly. So Cyblast uses possums. And both HMMs and possums come from an earlier technology, which is called a profile. And a profile comes from Michael Gistroff. So this, Michael Gistroff came up with this idea a long time ago. <coughs> he was generalized into hidden Markov models and possums. And the basic idea is you have a probability distribution over all the amino acids at every position. And how you get that probability distribution is what really differentiates uh, all these technologies. OK, so here we go. Um, here's an example of the pause domain, and you can see this is the clan, and there are these different members. So in the match um, to this potassium channel, we had this VTB underscore 2, and here we see that the clan has VTB underscore 2 as one of the members. But all of these would be determined to be homologous. So if you had a protein that had a 
let's say a back domain followed by the ion trans domain in the same order, you could say they had the same multi-domain architecture as this one, even though the names are different for that initial and terminal domain. So they are homologous. They just have slightly different functions, and, and the structures may have changed a little bit. So the ion trans domain is a very interesting domain because it's found in many different uh, ion channels. And it has six transmembrane helices. So you can see there's a lot of information about the protein. So they're saying this family is six transmembrane helices. Sometimes they're called transmembrane domains. So keep that in mind because I'm going to show you what happens when the transmembrane helix prediction tools are used and they miss that. So in this region, which is the ion trans domain, <coughs> I submitted the full length protein to TMHMM, which is a great resource. It uses a hidden markup model um, that models the whole multi domain architecture and parses a protein into cytoplasmic, extracellular, and transmembrane. And you'll see what it finds here that there are only four transmembrane helices here, 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 and here. <coughs> It misses this one, and it misses this one. So why is it missing them? And one of the reasons why, remember in the first lecture I gave, I talked about the understanding the types of errors that resources or tools will make, and why they make those errors, and what's the consequence of those errors. Um, transmembrane helix prediction depends on hydrophobicity, so hydrophobic <coughs> amino acids. And this particular region of the, the transmembrane domains has uh, several positively charged amino acids, so they're not hydrophobic. <coughs> and it makes it very hard for hydrophobicity-based prediction tools to detect that that region is, in fact, transmembrane. All right, so we're going to see more about that later. Um, here's the gene ontology. One of the things about the gene ontology is you've got go enrichment analysis. If you have expression data, as an example, what genes are expressed under a certain condition, you might be interested in finding out what pathway or process has, is represented in those genes. And this Go expression analysis is where you'd input your gene identifiers, and it would tell you what pathways or processes are enriched uh, in that particular scenario. This is not the same thing as the molecular function. So the gene ontology has many different categories. Molecular uh, function is one of them. You see here molecular function, cellular location, and processes. It also has others, but those are the three main <coughs> categories. Homology searches and inferences, so now we get to some nitty gritty concepts. Um, the tools that you'll use, BLAST is the most common one. So for highly precise identification of homologs, that's BLAST. What it misses are the remote homologs, so it's not good at detecting distantly related family members, but it's really good at very quickly detecting the closely related sequences. But it uses a local alignment <coughs> approach. So if your protein has two domains, as this KCNA1 protein has, it may find matches that only match this domain, and maybe they're at the C terminus in their protein. Let's call this A, and that's B. It may find proteins that have the C domain followed by the A domain. Or it may find proteins that have the B domain followed by a D domain. And the point is that these guys are not homologous to this guy, right? So there's another approach, which you may have heard of, which is called intermediate sequence search. And I didn't put this in except parenthetically um, into these slides. It basically says if you want to prove that X and Y are related, but you can't find a direct connection. You want to find an intermediate sequence that from X you can get to Z, and from Z you can get to Y. And then there's the transitive assertion. You're going to say, if X is related to Z and Z is related to Y, then X is related to Y. So that's a transitivity. But you can see in this case, that these guys, let's call this protein one, these guys are protein two, and that's protein three. One is related to two over the A domain, one is related to three over the B domain, but two and three are not related. So if you're gonna use intermediate sequence search, you have to be really careful 
to make sure that the region of homology overlaps. Have any of you heard of intermediate sequence search before this? Okay, that's good. Um, what you should know, what's meant by homology, so I put that in the previous slides, it means an evolutionary relationship. It doesn't mean that you have the same function. It doesn't mean that you have exactly the same structure. And it only means that there's an ancestral relationship and the functions and the structures may have changed. Um, how it's used in bioinformatics, it's used in many different ways, but primarily to infer function. The evidence that's required, so sequence alignment is the most common uh, approach that's used in their statistical analyses on, their, on the alignment, to give you an E value as an example. But there's also a rule of thumb. So this is a, uh, an English expression, a rule of thumb, which basically means kind of a, a rough idea, a rough approach to how to do something. And the Sander-Schneider rule, so this is Chris Sander and Reinhard Schneider, came up with this approach at EMBL Heidelberg years ago. They said, based on structural analysis, if you had 30% identity over 80 amino acids, so percent identity versus sequence length, I don't think many of you can read that. The longer the sequence length, the lower the percent identity. The shorter the sequence length, the higher percent identity that you need. So if you have eight amino acids, so about 80, here, you need 30% identity. And if you have a much longer alignment, you can have lower percent identity. If you have much shorter, you need higher percent identity. So that's a basic rule of thumb, and that also means relatively ungapped, very few gap positions. So if you're looking at an alignment and someone says something is 50% uh, identical, that means they're homologous. You need to know what's the length of that alignment. Um, so potential errors um, to make functional and structural inferences, which I started talking about. Um, the difference between divergent and convergent evolution. Anyone know what it means to have convergent evolution? So convergent evolution, someone's nodding their head in the back. Um, do you want to volunteer? No. It means that two proteins have converged on the same function. It doesn't mean that they have an ancestral relationship. So uh, there are different examples of this. But how do you say if something is related by convergent evolution? You need to look at the structures. If they have similar structures, if the structures can be superposed, <coughs> more likely it's a divergent evolutionary relationship. If you want to assert that they have converged on the same function through process called convergent evolution, they need to have different 3D structures. And then how do you use structured data to assert homology? And I'm going to show you how to do that. So profile, possum, generalization. What do we mean by generalization? The aim of a statistical model is to detect things that belong to a class. To have maximum precision so you don't detect things that are not homologous. But to also have maximum recall so that you can detect all of the family members ideally without bringing in anything that's not related. So this balance between precision and recall uh, is hard to achieve. And typically a method will go for one or the other. But most methods are going to be tested in terms of how they compare, sometimes in terms of a balanced <coughs> number of false positives versus false negatives. And at some point in this semester, you're going to learn about how to do precision recall and ROC curves. And that tells you essentially over the whole range, high precision, high recall, how do these methods perform on a benchmark data set. So then you get into issues about how the benchmark data set is designed and how the training is done. Um, so what you want in a HMM or a profile for homolog detection is you want to get, this is how uh, Cyglass works as an example, that close homologs um, in the first iteration are often going to get weaker scores in subsequent iterations. Has anyone actually noticed that? Have you run Cyglass? I'm going to actually show you an example of that in this lecture, so you'll see. So your query sequence, which is used as the seed for gathering homologs and for starting this whole process, will typically start with a very strong score. But by the next iteration of Cyglass, or by the next iteration when you actually construct a profile, that score may be weaker. 
But the more distant homologs that had only weak, had weak or barely recognizable scores in that first iteration when it's just blast will get stronger scores in the second iteration. And then if you had some non-homologs that had some weak <coughs> scores in the first iteration, hopefully by the second, third, whatever iteration, they're rejected. So that's what you want to achieve in an iterated sequence search approach. And Cyblast is often very good at doing that. So it tunes its parameters, so it has its defaults. If you don't mess with defaults, you will typically not make any mistakes. The defaults are set so that you will get that kind of performance. If you start including sequences that have E values, um, then you may have all sorts of problems called profile pollution or profile drift. So um, generalization techniques include sequence weighting, which is a way of distributing the weights across the set of sequences that you're using to construct your profile. Sometimes this means that outliers will get a lot of weight. So let me show you how that works. If you have if your sequence search, let's say you start here, here's your query, and then in your first iteration, there's a bunch of sequences that are not too far away, and then there's a couple of oddballs that are further away. So let's say that your, your results go like this. So you have four different groups. You've got your query sequence, you've got a large group of sequences that are relatively close by. You have a smaller group that is not so far away. And then you have one sequence that's a little bit further away. What sequence weighting will typically do is they'll say, we have one, two, three, four different groups. And we're going to distribute the weight among the four <coughs> groups uniformly. So these guys, as a group, will get one fourth of the weight. Your query sequence will get one fourth of the weight. This small group will get one fourth. And this outlier will also get one fourth. Now, if this outlier is really a homologue, then it's fine. But if this outlier is not a homologue, then you have a problem called profile pollution. You brought in something that's not related, and it's going to skew the profile. And if this is right next to a whole bunch of sequences, a very large group, then in the next iteration, the profile may be drifting in this direction. And then it may, over two or more iterations, may not recognize your query sequence. That's called profile drift. So profile drift can happen in a more benign way if they're all part of the family. But it can also be a problem when you bring in something that's not part of the family. <coughs> so here's an example with Cyblast. So I took uh, drosomycin as the query, and I decided to search Swiss Pro. Now, I don't recommend that you search Swiss Pro in Cyblast. It's just easier to interpret the results. You have fewer sequences. They're all annotated. Swiss Pro is the curated, manually curated section of Unipro. I don't know if it, they still call it uh, Swiss Pro. I think they just call it reviewed. Uh, because Swiss Pro was officially disbanded, I think, when uh, Amos Baroff left. They call it Unipro now, I think. They call it Unipro is the oh. parent, but the portion that used to be called Swiss Pro is not always called Swiss Pro, depending on the resource you go to. But you'll see yeah. reviewed. Reviewed means it's manually curated. And at NCBI, you can search Swiss Pro. At Unipro, you can also search uh, Swiss Pro. So it's just, I'm just cautioning you. So the first iteration of Cyblast is just BLAST. And then subsequent iterations is doing this possum creation. So just to remind you that drosomycin, that's this guy, 1MYN. And uh, Scott asserts that drosomycin is related to these antimicrobial antifungal proteins in plants and also to these uh, scorpion toxins. So these are toxins encoded in scorpion genomes, and sometimes they are uh, toxins for insects. <coughs> so here's what Scott looks like in the uh, superfamily, which is scorpion toxin-like. And you see we've got long-chain scorpion toxins, short-chain defensins, insect defensins, and plant defensins. And you can dig down, so here I've gone into uh, the short-chain scorpion toxin, so I'm looking at a particular protein and from this species, and you can see the PDB identifiers. So PDB identifiers, um, there are alpha uh, numeric, so four alpha numeric characters, followed by a chain identifier. So you often need to know what chain is referred to. The chain might be different parts of a PDB structure. It could be that for some PDB structure, let's call it 1XYZ, that there's chain A here, and chain B is here. 
So you need to know which chain is referred to. Um, so just bear that in mind. Um, so, so here this is at MCBI, and you can see I'm looking in Swisspro. There's the query. Um, it's only 44 amino acids. So the length of your query sequence is going to give you an effective limit on the score, which is going to give you an effective limit on the significance of the score. So the E values will be stronger when you have longer sequences. And the E values will be weak when you have shorter query sequences. So the first iteration, we side blast the queries at the top, and then we have these four hits. And these are all sequences that have scores below the threshold. And it's checking them because it makes it available to look at the alignments. Um, so of these sequences, uh, these guys are scorpion toxins, which is interesting. Um, and you can see the percent identity here. It's 53% identity. That's high, but it's over a, a short region. So the E value is only borderline significant. It's uh, 10 to the minus 4. But if we do iteration two, we get a lot more hits. But let's go back to iteration one and take a look again at the query sequence. <coughs> so the query sequence has an E value of 10 to the minus 27 in BLAST. By the time we get to the first iteration of side BLAST, which is the second iteration, the E value has dropped in significance. But the home logs now have much stronger scores, 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 9. And we get many more matches with strong scores. And sequences that were actually not homologous, that were below the threshold in, in BLAST, are now rejected. And you'll see that every time you run side blast it's fundamentally part of how that works. Now, if you just score PDB, so if you're looking for homologs in the cell structures, and you say, I'm just going to use side blast against PDB, if you get no <coughs> matches in the first iteration, so here we have, in the first iteration, we find the query but no other PDB structures, then Cyblast isn't going to do anything for you. Because Cyblast depends on sequences outside the query from uh, being brought in. Um, so what to notice about these Cyblast results against PDB or PDB Blast results? None of the E values, apart from the query, satisfy the significance threshold. And many homologs have insignificant scores. Um, Remember the Sanders Schneider rule. Some of these matches, including PDB structures, have uh, <coughs> partial alignments. That means it's over only a region. And this is an example of a partial homology or a partial alignment. So if it's restricted to a local region, that's a partial alignment. And so how do you differentiate spurious matches from two homologies? Sometimes uh, structure is helpful. And if you go to SCOP, so we're telling you SCOP is really useful, and it is. SCOP is incomplete. So most of these resources are created by a combination of computational tools and human expertise. And that human expertise and the computational tools, for that matter, um, are there <coughs> because of grant money. And grant money is limited. So when funding is limited, you don't have people to curate the database. You don't have people to write the code that's going to generate the data in the database. So every single resource that you use is going to show some of the impact of limited funding. So you have to be able to do some of these analyses yourself. And I'm going to show you some of how, how that works. Um, so two of the matches that we found in BLAST, so this first one, which is a ribosome biogenesis, you know, this, this E value is just, um, just above the cutoff. But it has high percent identity, and you'd be inclined to want to believe it. So we're going to have to try to look, take a look at it. Um, this one is called a defensin, and we know from Scott that Scott thinks that all these defensins are related, and that they relate to scorpion toxin. And uh, the E value is even less significant, <coughs> and the percent identity is low, and there, now there are gaps inserted. So by the alignment, from the pairwise alignment, you would not be able to say that either one of these is related. So now we want to go look at uh, structure. One of the things I should tell you is that this protein, I spent some time looking at it, 
I was able to find, um, just by running BLAST with this protein against PDB, PDB identifiers that SCOP had classified to that superfamily. So if you had a database set up, you could have your own database query and have all the PDB identifiers that SCOP had put in for each part of this hierarchy. And then you could run BLAST against PDB and record the region of overlap compare that to the region of overlap in SCOP, and then you'd be able to say automatically uh, that's part of that SCOP superfamily by transitivity. But that's not really available to you um, in any of the SCOP databases. Now, the Berkeley SCOP database tries to do that, but it's incomplete. So, um, so let's look at RCSV. So at RCSV, you can go to these analysis tools. You can come down to sequence and structure alignment. And that will give us an ability to compare 3D structures. So now I'm going to look at um, one MYN and this guy here, which is that plant defensin. And I'm going to use the JFATCAT uh, flexible structural alignment. So there's different structural alignment tools. One of the most famous ones is Dolly, which is not actually showing here. Um, but FATCAT is um, an excellent tool. I'd, the reason why I'm using flexible is that you can get 3D structures in slightly different conformations that their enzymes might be in a bound conformation or unbound. And so there's a slight flexibility around the hinge often. So if you use this flexible structural aligner, you can actually get the homologies um, that take that kind of flexibility into account. So here's what comes up. The E value now is significant and um, here it shows you the superposition of the two structures. And you can see that the one of them is colored light blue, the other one's kind of orange. Here the loop region is gray, so the loop regions aren't superposing very well. That's common. You've heard probably of specificity loops, maybe? So in enzymes, just as an example, um, you have an active site. <coughs> So the catalytic amino acids are typically held in a very strict conformation. But you have specificity loops that are often adjacent to the active site residues. The specificity loops will hold the ligand in place. And so since enzymes are part of superfamilies that recognize different ligands, the catalytic residues may be the same. But the ligands that they that they recognize will be different. And the specificity loops are designed to fit those ligands. So you'll see a lot of difference, differences here in the specificity loops. And that's kind of what we're seeing here, or potentially what we're seeing here. So you'll see subfamily specific conservation patterns in specificity loops, but global conservation across the whole family in the active sites, so different types of conservation patterns. Later on in the semester, I'll be talking about active site prediction and specificity determinants and the algorithms for that. So we'll go into depth then. Um, all right, so this is showing you that based on the structural analysis, you could assert that these two proteins are related by evolution. And that's the kind of thing that Scott did to create that superfamily, to define that superfamily. So they're looking at structural alignment and the significance of the structural alignment, among other things. So now I looked at this other protein, which is ribosome biogenesis. <coughs> and here, and I don't know if you can really see that, but the region that um, structurally superposes is really small. So in fact, you can superpose short regions without getting something that is functionally or structurally significant. And the E value here is not significant. This is 10 to the minus 1. So based on the structural comparisons, we would say there's no evidence for a homology or an evolutionary relationship between the drosomycin protein and this ribosome biogenesis protein. So it had very weak evidence for a homology from sequence similarity and very weak evidence for homology from structural alignment. And there's no reason to see a function. There's no functionally something in common functionally. Between scorpion toxin and the defensins, there are some functional similarities, and that's where we get to 
why Go is important. And I'm not even sure that Go solves this problem. But if you have a defense in, in the same family as a scorpion toxin, this is offense. That's defense. Doesn't really look like the same function, does it? So how do you assert that two proteins have a related function? That is where having some kind of an ontology of function is important. And that's where the gene ontology is supposed to come in. And I haven't actually done this, but I would assign this if I were your, if I were the, let's say the, the super guru that told you what to do and you were forced to do what I wanted you to do, I would say, go look at gene ontology and see if it finds a similarity or any kind of relationship between the plant and insect defensins and scorpion toxins. Because if it does, that's really useful. And if it doesn't, it's an opportunity for a PhD thesis or a master's thesis. Because you can imagine using these databases of structural superfamilies or PFAM plants to come up with ontologies that went beyond the gene ontology. That said, these functions are related. We don't know exactly how to explain their relationship, but we know they're related by some type of ontology. And then that would help you in your automatic function prediction. So let's continue. Um, now I'm looking for a 5CYK in stuff. So 5CYK <coughs> was uh, this guy, this ribosome biogenesis. So I wanted to see if Scott was going to put it in a related part of the hierarchy. And um, so I type in 5CYK here at the bottom, and then I click search. And this is what came up, no matches. So this happens often. So then what do you do? So then at that point, you can go look at the Berkeley version, which I did, and it didn't say anything. Or you could try to do this blast against PDB and you know cross-reference it with SCOP to see if anything had been classified. I didn't do that work. But that's what you'd want to do to be able to say 5CYK is definitively not homologous. And how do we determine homology or lack of homology in SCOP? If you recall, SCOP starts with class, and then from class it goes to fold, so there's many folds. Fold one to fold n and everything in between. Then every fold has some number of superfamilies. You may have one or more. And then every superfamily has some number of families. are in the same superfamily, they could be in different families, Scalp says they're related. So in scorpion toxin superfamily, if you're a scorpion toxin or a plant defensin or an insect defensin, each one of those is a different family, but they're in the same superfamily, so Scalp says they're related. If, however, you're in the same fold but different superfamilies, does anyone remember what Scalp says about that? If you're in the same fold but different superfamilies, Scott says, I don't know. She says it's indeterminate. So the relationship there is ambiguous. So when you're looking at benchmarking homology detection methods using Scott, if Scott has placed two proteins in the same fold but different superfamilies, it does not contribute to the, to the uh, recall. But it also doesn't contribute to false positive errors. It's basically ignored. Now, if two proteins are in <coughs> different folds, what does Scott say? Are they homologous or not homologous? How many want to vote for homologous if they're in different folds? How many want to vote for not homologous if they're in different folds? You guys get the point. So they're not homologous if they're in different folds. And Scott says the folds are different enough that you can assert that they're not related. If the folds look similar, but they're in different superfamilies, Scott just doesn't know. And an example of that is the Tim barrels. 
So 10 barrels, and I think it's one, two R's and one L, but it might be one R and two L. 10 barrels are a very large class of proteins. And the question is, does evolution just like making 10 barrels and they're not related by evolution, or are they all related by evolution? And nobody's 100% sure about that. So 10 barrels, I believe that they are a fold, but there are many different superfamilies within them. All right, so let's continue. Um, so here's Unipro. And I'm going to spend a little bit more time at Unipro because it's one of my favorite uh, databases. So I want to ask you a question. Do we stop at 10 o'clock and take a break, or we stop right now and take a break, or how does it work? Now, I guess. Do we stop it's, now and take a break? It's 45 minutes. Well, why don't we stop now, because it's kind of a natural time to break, and then I'll go into Unipro afterwards.